brainstorm. Today's episode is brought to you by Mary's Roadside Cafe at the corner of Route 3 and County Line Road. On Wednesdays, the patty melt is half price, and on Sundays, depending on how Mary and Ron do at the lake on Saturday, there's usually grilled trout, which they serve with roasted potatoes, the house salad, and sometimes butternut squash. Mary's Roadside Cafe. Good people, great food, and a killer view of the valley. It's very stirring music. I I feel like we should be uh, like organizing the war effort for the Allies or something. You know what I mean? It is very inspiring. It's it's decidedly dramatic. It just feels momentous. Like we're on the Manhattan Project or something. Yeah, it's cool. Maybe then it's not a good choice because then we sort of fall into this droning on of our stories and it's a little boring <laughs> it, it just sounds like music that you're you're rolling up your shirt sleeves to to get down to it you know what i mean yeah no it's like the reporter wearing the visor he's sitting down at the typewriter he's got a great story smoking a dart you know he's got a he's got a cigarette he's just wow. puffing away is, yeah. is dart is that something is, is i think uh, canadians say that it feels like canadian people say that i could see that um, but yeah, fantastic. But you know, before we even begin this upcoming episode, and I want to talk about last week for just a moment. That was a harrowing tale. And I think, I don't know if you've perused the email, but it freaked some listeners out. It was really bad timing. I did not realize that uh, you yourself had a uh, plane flight coming up uh, just the day after that. So that that was bad timing. Yeah, bad timing. If I had uh, known that you were flying, I would have gone with a different story. I definitely thought about I was seated at 9F, which, you know, as you, as you remember from last week, 19F is where uh, Juliana uh, yeah. was, was seated. So I was kind of, you know, freaked out. Yeah. I mean, was there a part of you that's like, okay, maybe I could go trade with the person in 19F, like sweeten the pot a little bit, you know, make a deal? No, I was more thinking about just not flying and just staying home and not dealing because I was too freaked out. How in the world does one person out of 92 survive? Seriously incredible. I feel like with plane crashes a lot of times it just feels like an all or nothing proposition you know and i I think 99.99 percent of the time it is isn't it i never hear of people except those guys from the soccer team yeah made sense that she wound up as a librarian you know what i mean like that that seems like um you know a good safe job after you've uh survived a plane crash yeah, probably not a lot of traveling, although there are conventions and you know, things <laughs> yeah. of that nature. Yeah. But it was definitely a, a, an incredibly impactful episode. Really sticks with you. Really sticks with you. Thank you very much. I, I loved telling you the story. Great job. Super excited now to give you a story, a tale. It's not as dramatic, but I'm not trying to compete on that level. No, no, especially because last week was a little bit of a throwback to uh, it, it did have a, a um, felt like a little good crossover. We were, we're finishing up with the shipwrecks. Right. This is sort of like a shipwreck. But no, I'm ready for okay. just uh, something. Different. This is going to be I, very I, I different. Don't, I don't, Okay, good. Coincidentally, there is a ship involved, but not really. So let's just get going. Okay, so okay. let me start. And I'll preface this by saying that the biography that we will be discussing today is really the biography of a people. However, in keeping with tradition, it's primarily going to be told through the biographies of two people. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's unorthodox. Wait, we just started Killer Biographies and you're doing this weird thing. No, I love it. I, I did run it past Brainstorm Corporate. So, and she was fine with it, Lizzie? Damn, well, she was decidedly nonplus, but I interpreted that as tacit approval. So I figured, you know what? Let's just do this weird version of a killer biography. And I'm just going to let nonplus just slide on by because that is definitely a word that I never can remember if it means that you're composed or that you're not composed. Yeah, and I think it's a little of both. I think that there's some interpretations of nonplus, which sort of, you know, um, I guess means that you're so overwhelmed, you don't even know how to respond. Or Mm. you kind of, you know, you're nonplus, you don't care. Yeah, but Lizzie, Lizzie always knows how to respond. Bottom line is we have approval. So this story is going to really tell the tale of two people. It's a, it's a, 
man and his great grandson. And, and corporate did sign off officially. On I mean, I'm still waiting. I think you have to sign it electronically. I don't think she does that. It, it'll get signed. Okay. This also tells the story of a you know unknown population and and perhaps even a, an event in American history that many people are not familiar with. Okay, is that framing it enough? That's a great frame, and it's already got me scrambling yeah. to try to put the pieces together. Let's there. jump into the first biography. Okay, so the okay. first biography um, in this tale of the two is a man named William Hutchinson Norris. He was born September 25th, 1800 in Oglethorpe, Georgia. Great. William Hutchinson Norris. His father was a North Carolina merchant. His mother, Nancy Wadkins from Virginia, was actually a relative of Thomas Jefferson. So, you oh. know, he's got that going for him. Okay. Uh, William Norris became affectionately known as the Colonel. Because he fought in the Mex- Mexican-American War and became a colonel. So it made sense. Great. It would be weird if he had like become a general, but then he was always known as the colonel. Like this is a good one. This is a good one to one like link up. Right. You know, he was a colonel and they're calling. It's him almost like colonel. if you just call someone captain, like, hey, captain. It's like, well, I'm not a captain. Right. I'm a brigadier general. <laughs> Norris, who's got this, you know, colonel moniker, is a well known yeah. politician. Now he lives in Alabama and he's a landowner. So he's born in Georgia, but he lives in Alabama. Yes. After the Mexican American war. He settles in Alabama. Uh, he serves on the Alabama state legislature. Okay. He also, so he was a senator and a member of the House of Reps. So he kind of did both within the state during the late 1830s and 1840s. In 1861, Norris was elected Grand Master of the Alabama Masonic Lodge. Uh, you got me nervous with the Grand Master because I, I knew it that wasn't going to be. I, I didn't say wizard. Yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be a chess Grand Master, and I both saw Alabama. I thought, oh boy. And I will say that your instincts are not far off the oh, mark. Oh no, really? Well, let's hold on. And um, yes, unfortunately, Un- unreformed racist. Let's let's let the tale unfold. So he was elected Grand Master of this uh, Masonic Lodge. You know, technically, that's just a Freemasons deal. And yeah, they, my they, granddad was in it. Oh, are you serious? Well, yeah. you know, they meet as a lodge, not in a lodge. You know, I always think of them in this cabiny, kind of like, well, let's go to the lodge. But the, the lodge really just refers to the chapter of Freemasons. Yeah. Meeting. But they got all the interesting little like um, like signs and design and trinkets and stuff and like you know you you rise to different levels. All right, sure. what, what kind like of video nonsense? Game. What kind of nonsense did the colonel get up to down there in charge of the lodge? Well, as I mentioned, he was a landowner and yeah. farmer. Ooh, uh oh, in Alabama, and it's before the Civil War. This is way before. Okay, so not just a landowner, but probably a slave owner. You are correct. Okay, he was a noted confederate everyone knew who he was during the civil war but is he a little long in the tooth for fighting at that point a little bit yeah, yeah. he's beyond fighting you know again he fought in the mexican-american war sure we th- we thank him for his service yeah kind of and <laughs> so he you know owned all this land in alabama he also owned the work staff which again unfortunate but that's what was going on in alabama at yeah. the time yeah. terrible one of his sons um, Robert actually fought in the Civil War uh, okay. in Stonewall Jackson's regiment. He fought over 44 battles. He was wounded and then eventually taken prisoner. That's the kid, Robert? That's this kid. That's okay. his kid. Robert gets released from this prison camp at the end of the war. And he's wandering around Wall Street and some stranger. By the way, those those prison camps were pretty gnarly. You know, were they? And, in the Civil yeah. War? I can't yeah, imagine there's... them being like really nice. And Andersonville, I think, is one of the bad ones. Ooh. Like, uh, it just wasn't good conditions. Like, no movie hall and like, hey, let's walk, you know, like that kind of thing. I guess no, the there's not movies. like separate restrooms for, you know, uh, men, women, all gender restrooms, you know. And a lot of starvation, I think that was an issue. That and hurts. illness, you know, illness yes. uh, just sweeping through the prison camp. But then how does he wind up up on uh, Wall Street? Well, he gets released from wherever this you know, camp was in yeah. prison and uh, he just ends up there. And the story, and I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but I did read it. The story is that a stranger bought him a meal and a train ticket back home. Now they say that it turned out that the stranger was John Jacob Astor, the no. millionaire trapper. Now that, that, that trap, the millionaire trapper, that that's what I've read. I'd, I can't vouch for that. Really? I'm huh. just telling you what they say. But it makes sense. I mean, the guy's got all the money in the world. Right. 
sees the guy down on his luck. He was. He was feels, a straggler. You know, and straggler. Looked very good. Yeah. You know, and he feels like, all right, he was on the losing side. You know, he's uh he's kind of at rock bottom. Let me yep. let me do something nice for or him. Or he was thinking, let's get this guy. <laughs> let's get this here. racist right. guy back to Alabama. Yeah. Let's ship this guy out for free. Yeah. But yeah, so generally speaking, after the Civil War the Southerners were like, uh-oh, like they felt like they had been invaded, right? Like, in, in fact, some soldiers did destroy plantations. Yeah, I mean, I remember Sherman with the march to the, the sea. The bow ties know, the with the railroad trash. Yeah. yeah, terrible. And so there's a lot of hatred, you know, that was starting to build up amongst the Southerners who felt that their way of life had been taken away from them. And it had, and for good reason. Yeah, but and also just totally enraged then that black Americans are starting to participate in government and voting and all that stuff. Yes. So, yeah, 100%. They toxic, were toxic, toxic uh, mix. Yeah, not good for building, you know, positive relationships. So, a lot of these Confederates in the South basically were unwilling to live by these new rules, you know, the hmm. constitutional changes. You know, kind of referring to the end of slavery, uh, the loss of political power with, as you mentioned, African-Americans getting voting rights, being able to participate in Mm -hmm. local government. They were not happy. No, they hated Reconstruction. Terrible. Not what they were looking for. And they were always, uh, you know, I know that one epithet back then was carpetbaggers, you right. know, people coming down from the north to, uh, you know, make a buck or yep. try to, you know, buy up some land or whatever the carpetbaggers used to do. Right. Okay. So, uh, but Robert gets his train ticket back home, back south. I will say while he's away, everyone thinks he's dead. And you know, yeah. they haven't heard from him in four years or three and a half yeah. years. While he's away, there's all this fear and anxiety building up amongst the Southerners who realize their way of life is going to be stripped from them, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Crime me a river. But, you know, I'm just reporting the facts. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't go to war if you, you can't live with the possibility the of losing it. Yeah. Right. So while this was happening, there were other countries that were advertising themselves to these Southerners saying like, hey, you know, you don't want to stay in that country. That's terrible. Really? Why don't you come live over here? That really? is true. In September of 1865, the New Orleans Daily Picayune, am I pronouncing mm-hmm. that right? You Your are. Newspaper guy. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I applied there. Oh, there's really? barely, yeah, there's barely a newspaper in this country that I haven't applied to. At one, <laughs> but you've at worked at point. a lot of them. I have worked at a handful, but I'd say, um, you know, my success rate on those blanket applications was, yep. you know, under, uh, under 0.05%. Not a healthy uh, percentage. <laughs> no, it was the old days. You know, you couldn't send emails or anything. I'm curious why foreign countries want any part of it 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 feels like okay they just lost a war a lot of them are horrible racists like what why are they trying to get them over to their country it's a a perfect uh transition and i'm going to tell you why oh okay first let me read you this uh excerpt from the new orleans daily picayune i've never been to new orleans (sighs) unbelievable go ahead new orleans is incredible beautiful city great food so the newspaper wrote quote Many persons who, from long habit and fondly cherished theories, have become strongly attached to the institution of African slavery. Fancy that in Brazil, they will find an opportunity for the permanent use of that system of labor. Brazil Uh, and the uh, Spanish uh, possessions being the only two slaveholding communities remaining in the civilized world. Yikes. Come on to Brazil. We're not oh asking boy. any questions. It's, you know, what goes on in Brazil, wow. you know. Yeah. I did not realize that. I tend to think of America as being sort of the, mm-hmm. the last we were not. holdout. We were close. The mm-hmm. Brazilian emperor was this guy, Dom Pedro II. Yeah. Dom Pedro II, he saw this opportunity and he hoped to build up Brazil's cotton production for export uh, to all the looms in England and France. Yeah. So they had always relied on the Deep South. He knew that that market was going to be disrupted. So he thought he could entice these Southerners to come to Brazil. Because they knew how to to run that system. They knew, you know, how to grow cotton and harvest it on the backs of, uh, you know, enslaved people. They know how to work with slaves. So terrible, but that is what they were appealing to. That Mm -hmm. was this ideological identification between the empire 
of Brazil, as it was known at the time, and the south of the United States. Slave agrarian. Yeah. Does anybody take him up on this offer? That's kind of a crazy thing to imagine going from the south, then all of a sudden down to Brazil. Enter Colonel Norris and his son. So Robert comes back and his dad, the colonel, has been reading all about Brazil. And he is one of those staunch Confederates who does not like what's coming, and he wants to get the heck out of there. Wow. He sells all of his land and his slaves, and he puts all the gold into sacks. So he's just going to take the sacks. You know, this is like, kind of reminds me of some of these shipwrecks. It's like, I was going to say, if this was last season, this would be a different ending. But uh, I feel like based on the fact that- We're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I mean, I'm I'm fascinated by the uh, Brazil connection. I wonder how many people took them up on this whole thing. I'm going right. to tell you. It's insane. Yeah. Colonel's ready to go, and in walks his son, who they thought was dead. And when he walks in, he looks like oh, the walking dead. He's so gaunt, yeah. you know, as you mentioned. You know, so maybe he uh, asked her, you know, just like, you know, gave him the one meal and the and the train fare, but not enough money to get good meals all the way down on the train. Yeah, not entirely generous, more focused on what I was thinking. Like, just Let's get him get out this of here. Guy, this guy. I mean, this guy's scary to look at. Get him off the streets. Right. You know? So as soon as he walks in, his father's like, hey, do you want to go to Brazil? Well, first, maybe he gives him something to eat. Maybe he says like, okay, look, you look like you need <laughs> yeah. a nap, but you I got to ask you something, like, but come sh- find me when you wake. You look like shit. On the other hand, I thought you were dead. So I guess you look great (laughs) compared to that. You're like a vacation in South America. (laughs) Oh. So he asked his son, he's like, you know, I'm I'm ready to go. Do you want to go? And his son immediately agrees. Yeah. What else do I have to lose? Why not? Already lost everything. Plus, you've already sold all our land. So I guess I'm going with you. Does the colonel have a wife who comes with him or not? Not yet. You know, he's going to go first with Robert and they're going to suss it out. Like, is this true? Is this really as good as, you know, the emperor's cracking it up to me? And with the sacks of gold, he'll probably be able to find a wife down there. We know what's going on down there. Again, this is like Vegas. Within just a few months of the surrender at Appomattox, these guys are out of there. They're on their way in December of 1865 to Rio de Janeiro incredible he's never he's never left left the deep south except for fighting in the wars like he's you know and he's on his way to south america of course the other guys fought against the mexicans he huh? had the dead the colonel. the colonel the colonel yeah okay well, do they take uh do they take a boat down there they do they take a okay. ship they head down to brazil and they are greeted in brazil by emperor dom pedro the <laughs> second okay <laughs> and oh. he goes on to ask them where they are from in the States. The colonel tells them Alabama, and the dom said, well, since the Tropic of Cancer runs close to Birmingham, Alabama, and the Tropic of Capricorn runs through Sao Paulo in Brazil, I will arrange for you to have some land under the Tropic of Capricorn. You will feel more at home in that climate. Oh, and by the way, bring all your belongings (laughs) duty-free. So weird. I mean, the fact that the emperor himself <laughs> meets them mm-hmm. makes me think that um, they're they're pretty desperate for some Americans to come down and, and uh, help out with the cotton trade. Yeah, you know, it doesn't scale. Like in terms of him marketing Brazil as the place to come, like if he has to greet every guy that, that lands there. <laughs> Also, what's with the what's with the uh, astrological knowledge? <laughs> and uh, and please step know, over here. I'm going to read Alabama. your cards. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what <laughs> yeah. where your fortune will be made. You know, he becomes this like hero to all of the Confederates who came to Brazil. They think of him as like a national hero, like Washington or Jefferson. Who the colonel or the emperor? The, they think of the emperor. As yeah. this national hero to all of the Confederates. <laughs> yeah. The slaves don't feel that way, but yeah. It's a safe assumption. So so he's this huge hero. And I'm going to go off on a quick tangent around slavery because it I was abolished. Tangents. Yeah. You love tangents on slavery. The, the slavery was abolished in 1888. Okay. and In it, Brazil. In Brazil. Sorry. Yes. Okay. In Brazil. And okay. ultimately, they said only a handful of the immigrants actually owned slaves. The rest preferred not to own slaves because they said they would rather be able to fire their help. (laughs) I love that it's not moral scruples. Yeah, it's not because it's it's evil, immoral, and I I can't believe you just gave me that reason with a straight face, but whatever. That's why they preferred not to have slaves. Huh. 
Wait, um, they get rid of slavery like 20 years after the colonel and his, his son get there. Cause That's his, true. the colonel That's and true. his son go down in 1865. Correct. Yes. Then in the 1880s, they, they get rid of slavery. Yeah. But prior to that, and again, that was called a tangent. I was just letting you know when the slaves, you know, sure. Because the colonel did acquire a couple slaves with some land he bought in Brazil. But in any case, by 1888, that's that party's over. Okay. So in 1867, which is two years after they arrived, the Norris family left from New Orleans uh, aboard a ship called the Talisman, bound for Rio. So they were on their way to meet the colonel and the son. Is this like who? Who? Sisters, you said the Norris family. Yes, yeah, like sisters, sisters, mom, aunts. You know. Yeah. Like the rest of the fam. Yeah, they're all coming, and so they get on board the talisman. Apparently, and again, not verifiable, but the captain asked the women to remove the metal hoops from their skirts. What? Apparently, he was going to throw off the balance or the magnetic. That he was, he didn't what? like that. Yeah, I'm just reporting facts. Give me a break. It sounds like he's making a move on one of the ants no, or something. No, no, he's a very straight laced guy. He's, uh, awfully hot out. You sure you don't want to take the hoops out of your uh, hoop skirt there? <laughs> Boy, these get tropics get very humid. I see that you're very hot. Um, so the steel hoops were stacked and stored on a shelf. Now, they sailed on, and when they finally neared land, they realized that they had arrived in Africa instead of South America. <laughs> no, now, 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 now no. the captain is blaming it make... on the hoops, and he's saying that it turned the ship's compass around and directed is, the ship to Cape Verde Islands. That is one of the lamest excuses I've ever Supposedly heard. Supposedly they discarded the hoops and then they made their way to Brazil. So it took forever to get to get <laughs> Now along the way they also encountered an incredibly bad storm and the ship was damaged. So they they didn't reach Rio until like April. They had been sailing for like 4 months. Like they're all over oh the place. Oh my lord. How did how did that not how did that ship uh, that star cross ship not wind up on season one of uh, or season three of Killer Shipwrecks? But it doesn't go down. It reaches Rio. It does reach Rio, and you know the dad and 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 the son like they sort of gave up on these guys. Like I don't think we're gonna ever see them again because uh, it took four months. Now, when you say they gave up on them, do you mean they uh, formed connections with other females down in you know where, Brazil? I, I can't speak for that as a behavior that they engaged in i don't know yeah that probably wasn't included in their correspondence what happens in brazil stays in brazil until someone else finds out and we have not found out (laughs) they're late but they get there in that ensuing two-year period colonel norris had bought the hacienda machado which came with a couple slaves so so he acquired manuel and jorge and the interesting thing is he Mm -hmm. did teach them english and he taught them english but with a very thick southern accent and, and I'm not making that up because that actually happened everywhere. So whenever these Confederates arrived, they would teach the local population English and they would actually speak English to their kids. Uh, they did learn Portuguese, but they still spoke English. And so everyone who spoke English had this very thick Southern accent. <laughs> these Brazilians walking around with redneck All over accents. The place. Did the uh, colonel have a big fat spread? I mean, did he have a huge he chunk of land? So he installed himself in these yeah. lands near the Machadino estate, as I mentioned, which is right near a river, uh, the Quilombo. Mm-hmm. Um, and Norris's farm was in a central part of the Sao Paulo state. And it actually became the focal point for that settlement was his land. Big deal. Oh. You know, this guy was a big deal. So he's known among other former Confederates as like, oh, you know, he's got a he's got a foothold down there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone knows the yeah. colonel. Now, incidentally, and you'll appreciate this, as will our board, uh, when Norris first arrived in Brazil, he came to a colony known as Lizzie Land. No. It was named for the daughter of a reverend who had gotten there first. To, to, it was sort of like a founding member of this colony. Ah, cor- corporate's going to yeah. love this. All right, Lizzie Land. The land in Lizzie Land was not great for cultivating. And so oh. Lizzie Land turned out to be a bit of a bust. Hmm. They had to venture into the interior. Yeah, I bet there's some, at least some poisonous snakes All and stuff, of stuff. Some bad spiders. Yeah, like those footlong yeah. spiders that uh, our friend Juliana encountered. Yeah, Goliath oh, birdieing geez. spiders. Nightmare. That's a nightmare. Uh. So they ventured inland. They came to a place where the colonel and his son saw this red look in the soil. And that reminded them of Alabama. So they decided it would be good for cotton and corn. So that's when they settled uh, near a trading post in what would eventually become known as the town of Americana, Portuguese for American. 
Yeah, the red soil. The South is famous mm-hmm. for that, right? Doesn't um, MLK in the I Have a Dream speech, he says something about the Does red he? soil. Oh, that's I cool. I could be making I could be making that's that good. up. Okay, so they but because these guys they know, know soil and they're like, This is this is rich uh right. soil. And again, slavery's still legal. Uh, so they immediately start planting cotton. And do they have uh, good access like either by river or a road or something to get the cotton to Both. a port? They're right on the river, the main river. Norris also starts serving as an imperial congressman in the state of Sao Paulo. And he was commissioned the rank of mm. colonel in the Brazilian National Guard. So he's involving himself. I wonder if he's then a citizen of Brazil or America. He was given citizenship upon arriving. I mean, when the emperor himself meets you yeah, at the that's dock, a good sign. yeah, it feels like everything else. Well, is and kind he's of... like reading your sign. He's like, "What are you, Sagittarius? We're going to get along great. <laughs> Just come in. Like, yeah, I love it here. You've got the makings of an imperial congressman. <laughs> what are you, Pisces? Step over here. <laughs> I wonder how the Brazilian cotton stocked uh, stacked up against the um, the cotton from the American South. Well, you know, interestingly enough, I'm guessing not as well because they they soon really pivoted to watermelon, which had been brought in oh. by a guy from Georgia. And they started just harvesting, or, or sorry, they started growing watermelon. Really? That was big. Yeah, because I was wondering, like, did the uh, guys from the um, Alabama bring, like, cotton stock or seeds or something? They did. They brought grow? all kinds of things. Yeah. They also brought, you know, culture. They brought, like, fried chicken, southern fried chicken. Like, that actually became a thing. <laughs> that they started. So, yeah, they brought many things. Obviously, the seeds. And they, and they named the uh, town America. That's what it eventually became known as. That was not what okay. it was called when Norris was there. So, hmm. in 1870, as luck would have it, the railroad finally reached that area. And that's when that whole area became known as the Village of the Americans. And then eventually uh, called Americana. But Norris is credited as a founder of that town. Maybe he had something to do with the railroad. Well, you got to figure. Use one of those one of those sacks of gold to say, uh, I'll make it worth your while if we can uh, slightly adjust this plan for the railroad. Who says there. so? Oh, the Imperial Congressman from the state of Sao Paulo. Got two two sacks of gold that says so. Yeah. So does Brazil, Do you, this might be outside the purview, but does Brazil become a um, significant agrarian or, you know, exporter of, of farm products ba- because of these Confederates? Yes, or not a little really? bit. Like mainly, as I said, in watermelons. Um, to Hmm. Europe. And, you know, roughly 5,000 men, women, and children came to Brazil from the southern states right after Appomattox. Like literally 5,000 people settled. Really? Wait, 5,000 settled down in Brazil? In this area. First, they all sort of, you know, stuck together. Like they, they, you know, married within the people that had emigrated. They built southern style wood houses, that stood out from the stucco and tile that were popular. And so, you know, they, they also brought, though, all these new foods and pecans and Georgia peanuts. And, and most importantly, they brought technology because they brought these tools like the iron plow and kerosene lamps. I bet those were some tasty watermelons. I was reading, somebody sent me uh, recently a couple, I have received a couple of gifts that don't say who they're from. Mm. Both were excellent. One was a t-shirt, which I still wear, long sleeve t-shirt. The other one was the collected writings of this guy, Charles Portis, the guy who wrote True Grit and some other, some other books. He's a writer from the South, but you know, in the collected writings, he has some recollections about his childhood. And he said, one of the things that they would do as, um, kids with the watermelons as he said we'd go down to the creek to swim in the creek and you just toss the watermelons into the water so that they would stay cool oh. they just kind of like float on the water but they'd be cooled off by the water so that once we're done you know swimming in the creek and messing around and it's time to eat you know they're nice and and chilly i, I want to yeah. try that somehow watermelon is yeah, great I love watermelon uh, un- unless it's just like a little bit past yeah, it and it's, it's kind of gl- it's like grainy Fibrous and sandy a little bit yeah like, and then you always had the thing like don't swallow a seed or it'll grow inside yeah, you yeah, it's a great fruit because you get the, get the seed i mean it has a lot going for it so sweet yeah, very good. yeah but again so they brought the, you know all these americans brought their own sort of purview uh in and one of the positives uh was they established public schools that provided education to female children which was unusual uh in brazil at that time so so good stuff you know some good things happen i wonder if they the um gringos are picking up any portuguese they are they slowly start to okay. adopt the language and mm-hmm. again 
they still spoke English, but they learned Portuguese and started to assimilate. Now, do any of the Norris clan start to intermarry and, and breed with the locals? Not so much. And, and we're going to get to huh. a great transition into what we'll hear on the other side of the break. Okay. They primarily married within those sort of like expats, if you will. Yeah. Now, Norris, uh, yeah. Norris ended up dying at the age of 93, and he died in that wow. original settlement. It was called Santa Barbara de Oeste. Uh, on July 13th, 1893. So he's born in 1800. He died in 1893 in Brazil. And when you see a picture of him, it's like he looks like a classic guy from the South. Like it's weird that he lived so long in Brazil. Yeah, let's see. What would that be? 65 to 93. So, you know, 30 Almost, yeah, years. 30 years. That's, like a, long, that's a long time. And, and don't forget at first, they were living in shacks. Like this was like in the jungle. Like they, they didn't have real places to even live. So those first couple of years were not that great. Yeah. And I imagine like when the, the wife and the aunts and some of the women folk finally get there on their, after their long journey on the ocean, I'm sure there was some like, oh God, this is Brazil. You know, can we turn back? I like where we were before Cape Verde. Like, let's, let's go back there. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's hear from our good friends and the current sponsor of Killer Biographies, Rapid City Laundry. I know a lot of people writing in about this, but, you know, they do a great job. Well, also, they have a great old sign. I don't know if it's still up or not, but they used to have a a huge sign above their uh, laundromat. So classic. Well, let's hear from Rapid City and then we'll tell you what happens uh, next. Let's do it. Spring is here and so is the mud. But when your favorite clothes get soiled, don't let your day be spoiled. Visit Rapid City Laundry and let their expertise in dry cleaning and laundry services wash your concerns away. A proud member of the International Fabric Care Institute, Rapid City Laundry now offers free pickup and delivery in Ashland Heights, Box Elder, and Somerset. Look for their famous neon sign at 312 West Main Street in downtown Rapid City. And if you mention Killer Biographies, you'll receive 20% off all fluff and fold services. Rapid City Laundry, keeping the Rapid Valley stain-free since 1928. Do you think we could join the International Fabricare Institute, or is that uh, just strictly a professional association? Like you have to have, own a laundromat to join. Yeah, that I don't. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure we don't meet the requirements, be it some sort of testing or some knowledge. Just a cool group. I I you know it's worth an inquiry. Could could we pay them fifty bucks for the? I year bet it's a certificate a you put up in the, in your shop. Yeah, but also maybe they have like a convention somewhere. You know. Might be fun Hello. to party with All right, those so guys. When we left, you know, uh, Colonel Norris had passed away, but he had established this town essentially in Brazil. How strange is this? It is so strange. I, I never knew about this. I didn't know Brazil made a play for the uh, for the defeated Confederates, the people with um, some cotton experience. And they stayed. I mean, you could imagine a scenario where they, they talk people into coming down there and then people are like, this sucks, you know, and they just turn right around. But these these people. Well, they stayed and some of them even came back to America to go to med school and then went back to Brazil. Seriously? Yeah. Like they yeah. were very committed to Brazil. Let's cut to 1953. Whoa. We're, we're jumping way ahead there. Now, this is 60 years after the colonel passed. I laid it all out for you. He has this whole thriving community. There's 5,000 people people who moved over. And that was in 1865. Now let's jump ahead to 1953. Okay. I'll do that. A journalist from the New Yorker magazine decides to go to Brazil and they plan to meet with Colonel Norris's great grandson. His name is Horace Frederick Piles. Okay, That's a tough Horace name. Frederick Piles. He was born on June 28th, 1909. I mean, Piles is another word for hemorrhoids. Is right? that true? That's true. What's the speller? Uh, I don't know. P I L E S. Okay, well, this is P Y. I first learned that as a child when um, George Brett had to uh, sit out oh, some right. World Series games for hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids. Problems. I didn't know that they called it pile. Like I remember Gomer Pile. I watched that show, Gomer Pile. <laughs> okay, so so Horace Frederick Piles is the great grandson. The great grandson of Norris on his mother's side, Judson Piles, was also one of the early settlers in the area shows how firmly they took root down there if their great grandsons are still uh, down exactly. there. Exactly. I can see why the folks at the New Yorker would be, I mean, it's a fascinating it's thing. It's crazy. So Horace 
you know, went to college in Brazil and he ended up working for a large uh, American corporation that had an office in Brazil. Then he sort of grew disillusioned with that and he went back to farming. And then Hmm. ever the enterprising individual, he started a soft drink plant, which incidentally is what a lot of Southern businessmen in, in America did. Like Coke that started in Atlanta. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so he produced a drink called Crush, which is like Orange Crush, but uh, it was pronounced Krush for, for whatever that is worth. <laughs> okay. But it was a, it was an orange flavored uh, beverage? Yeah. Okay. But, but, but it's not the same, the Crush that you know. So anyways, when this journalist from The New Yorker met Horace, who again, is sort of this third generation or fourth generation Brazilian, they said he looked as if he had just stepped off Main Street in a small town in Georgia. Well, that was my thing is I I had an immediate like the land that time forgot question, which is like, okay, so when you go down there, are they still stuck in there like antebell or, you know, uh, just (laughs) after the war ways, you know, are they still um, not entirely, but yes, they're very proud of their heritage. So the other thing that the reporter noted instantly was that he spoke English with a very thick Southern accent, even though he's fluent in Portuguese. Yeah. Um, yeah, even though he, he's long removed, his family's long removed from the South, but that's just, uh, the really crazy thing was going to be for that New Yorker reporter to, uh, bump into some native Brazilians who are also speaking <laughs> with a Southern accent. Right. And that happens everywhere. Everyone <laughs> who's speaking English has a Southern accent. It's like, you guys know, I do not want a mint julep. Please right. stop asking me. Right. I'm not sure if there's still hoops in the skirts or if that's... <laughs> still throwing off navigation. So uh, Horace sort of talks about the, the history of, you know, these people that who, who became known as the confederados, um, that they taught Brazilians how to farm. That Brazilians, you know, as mentioned, like they didn't know what they were doing. I bet they knew how to grow some stuff. You know, it's they're not idiots and it's not the most complicated thing no, in the world. But in this part of Brazil, which was fairly remote at the time, the Brazilians, you know, had to learn how to farm. They also didn't have the instruments. So they taught them how to make plows and things like that. Yeah, now that makes sense that they were bringing some new technology. So right. I, I can see that, that they boost production. So anyways, Horace ended up traveling all over the South in America to see sort of his ancestors area. Really? Yes. Um, and he said that he was very homesick. And said that he's a Brazilian and that he would never live anywhere else. I wonder if the the family, you know, relatives who stayed in America, if they stayed in touch through all the years with the folks that had gone down to Brazil. Yeah, there are articles of people talking about their relatives who left after the war, you know, that date back to the late 1800s. And then not a lot since then. You know, a lot of the 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 sort of history of these people was lost because they started producing it in Portuguese instead yeah. of English. And so no one in America is reading any of Portuguese. Yeah, but now with 23 and Me, there's going to be all these people up in Alabama that are like, why do I have all these like third cousins down in uh, Brazil? For you sure. Know? Also, when enough time goes by, I assume that they do start, you know, some of the the uh, descendants do start to fall in love with the locals and intermarry. Well, there's quite a bit of that, just not in the Norris family. But yeah, that happens all over the place. Like that's that's what starts happening. But anyway, so the reporters in this small town called Baru, which she said looks like a small American town. <laughs> the reporter said the similarities were, were so voluminous that he just stopped taking notes. He's like, this just looks like America. Wow. Which is crazy. And not just America, but like America probably like circa 1870. You know what I mean? Like even right. though it's 1950, it still has a flavor of the old days. Right. And so the stars and bars, you know, the Confederate battle flag have been visible in this area forever. Oh, God. A lot of the Confederados were buried in the flag. Yeah. For them, it, it doesn't have the same meaning. So every year they have this festival and it's all Confederate flags and people dressed in Confederate uniforms and hoop skirts and food of the American South. This is insane. Down in Brazil? Yes. I mean, if you think, you know, South America is also where a lot of Nazis went. And I'm not trying to say that the uh, right. folks Nazis, from the American right. South were Nazis. But, you know, it's like people who are looking for a radical new start after um, sort of disaster in the homeland. I don't love making the Confederate flag a big part of uh, continuing daily culture. They don't they don't associate it with that. I know they don't associate. I'm just saying if I, you know, was wandering through town, that would creep me out a little 
little bit to see yeah. a lot of Confederate flags around. It is kind of tricky what they do there with the where Confederate gets turned into Confederados. That's, right. that's a, that trips right off the tongue. Right. But you know they want to preserve their immigrant culture. Like that's what they say. Yeah. So do they do a big fat write up in the New Yorker where they you know yes. But this is 1953. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a lot of Americans that are like, wait, what the hell? Yes. Really? Yes. How about in the year 2023? Is there any still remaining vestige? No, but I mean, are there still people who trace their, like, yes. yeah, you know, I'm a direct descendant of, uh, of the Colonel? Absolutely. And a lot of these descendants come back to America to go to Civil War battlefields. They participate in reenactments and they, they visit all these places where their ancestors lived. You know, it's like going back to Europe if your family you know, came over from Europe. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty bizarre. Now, check this out. In 1972, yes. then Governor Jimmy Carter and his wife, mm-hmm. Rosalind, were traveling in Brazil. And they made a little detour down to Americana because the grave of Rosalind's great uncle is there. No. Because he emigrated to that area. Yes. Carter at the time noted that these Confederate descendants, which at that point were fifth and sixth generation, sounded and looked exactly like American Southerners. Incredible. The Carters then attended a Confederate picnic at this famous cemetery. Mm -hmm. And they said, quote, they sat at the cemetery saying Dixie had tears streaming down their faces. Fun fact, I met Rosalind when I was a little kid. Really? Yeah, my school choir uh, performed for her and some other dignitaries, so we got to uh, meet the First Lady. That's seemed very cool. sweet. That's seemed very, very cool. sweet. Yeah. And Jimmy Carter was sort of like the good guy. I thought you were going to say, 72, I thought you were going to say a governor. I thought we were going to be talking about George Wallace, like the no. segregationist no. governor. There's actually a photo of Carter at the memorial in the cemetery with some of these fifth generation southerners. Must be just such a strange, because he's also very connected to the agrarian South. Yes. So he, well, they brought Georgia peanuts. He would know what the old style cooking tasted like and all, and all that. And it must be very strange to get down to B- Brazil and be tasting, you know, like the best fried chicken he's ever had. But not a good look to be, you know, tearing up at Dixie right down there. Yeah. I and mean, Rosalind's I mean, there. You know, back then, 1972 was very different from 2023. So, you know, I'm glad we're in 2023, but I don't hold it against Jimmy that he teared up at the sound of Dixie. What happened after he left was that the government of Americana incorporated the Confederate flag into its coat of arms. (laughs) Yeah, see, I'm uneasy with this part of the story. That part is bad, but but fortunately... Back off a little bit on the flag. (laughs) They did remove it a few years later. Uh, from okay. the official city symbol. The descendants of these Confederates, they say, now comprise about a tenth of the city's population in that area. Wow. Do, do we know, is this like out in the sticks? Like, where is it compared you know, to, in Sao you know, Paulo, it's, it's like um, probably an hour from Rio by plane. Not too bad. The author of this New Yorker piece, uh, his name was Hamilton Basso. Uh, okay. He wrote this piece in 1953. It's a great piece and there's great advertisements because it's just one of those like microfiche yeah. versions. It's yeah. very cool. A lot of Edgar Bergen or whoever had that puppet, I guess he was performing back then in 53. You get tickets for that. This reporter who was really blown away by all of this. You know, this is pretty strange, you know, to see this Southern culture in the wilds of Brazil. And I bet he was drunk just about every night down there. I imagine they, they really laid it out with the food and the parties and the festivals, and they just showed this guy a good time. Would that have been moonshine? He might have is, picked is, up a disease or two while he was down oh, there. I would say that's a safe bet. Yeah. The author wanders around this famous cemetery and Horace uh, had had dropped him off. And he recorded that one of the gravestones of his great-grandfather was there. And it just says, in memory of Colonel William H. Norris, born September 25th, 1800 in Oglethorpe County, Georgia, USA, and died July 13th, 1893, age 93 years. Then he saw the grandfather's headstone, Dr. Robert Norris, a Confederate veteran, 1837 to 1913. Yeah, that's the kid. That's the kid. And then he goes on to write, cemeteries are lonely places. And I had the usual lonely feelings. Oglethorpe County and the Confederacy seemed very far away. But even so, I think that in silence, had I wanted to, I could have heard the distant sound of drums. I remembered Mr. Piles standing in his fields and brushing the earth from his hands, ready to continue the Confederate adventure. And I thought that they would have understood one another, he and the old colonel and the colonel's son. 
And that's how he ends the piece. Unbelievable. I mean, that this guy, Horace, you know, this was in the 50s. Now, interestingly enough, there's no record of when Horace passed away. Hmm. He, he never married and he never had any kids. I mean, I really am curious now because, okay, so 53 and now another 70 years have yes. passed. And so I wonder, are they still having some annual festival or are they still marking, you know, certain days that are connected to their past in the American South? I, I think it's evolved to be a little more in line with the times, but there are still a lot of remembrances and frankly, a lot of symbolic stuff still there because again, they don't view the Confederate flag as having any political symbolism like hmm. it does in the United States. But are there still people running around with last name Norris or yes. Piles yes. or, or yes. Wagner or whatever? Really? Yeah, a smaller percentage of the population, but they're definitely still there uh, because they had a lot of kids. So some of these first waves, you know, they needed help in the farms. Where they'd have like 15 kids. And so the, the population exploded. I wonder what they thought when it's like they've been down there 20 years and then Brazil's like, oh, actually, we're getting rid of slavery. Were they like, oh, God, yeah, I don't like, know. Wait, what country do we go to now? Like, is there a country <laughs> anywhere? That... When you mentioned those Spanish possessions in the ad, like where, what do you think <laughs> more specific? <laughs> yeah. What's the status there as far as legislation and human property? Incredible tale. You have to see the photo of, of Carter standing with these fifth generation confederados in front of the confederate flag at this famous cemetery where norris is buried i had known nothing about it i'd never heard of the confederados i did not know that brazil made a play for the cotton growers of the american south right and that people accepted the uh accepted the invitation and really made a successful endeavor of it and think about that guy robert you know who like barely survives a prison camp thinks he's gonna starve to death or, you know, be or die, you know, from illness or whatever. It's like, think of what he's seen. He's in 44 battles and he's in a prison camp. Then, you know, he gets a free meal from Astor on the on a Wall Street sidewalk. And then all of a sudden he's in Brazil within five months. Yeah. And the rest of his life is down there. That's well, crazy. No, what's crazy is he came back and got a medical degree. Yeah. And then went back. So he became a doctor. Yeah. I mean, just insane. And how about that the emperor himself is there to greet them when they <laughs> arrive? I wish there was videotape because did that, did he really break out the astrology? <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> So, Dude, the moon uh, is rising. What are you, is he reading the emphemeres or whatever they're called? Do you think that we could, because of the mirror, the wonders of the internet and uh, modern um, transport finance and so forth, I would like to get my hands on one of those watermelons that they grow I down know. there and taste exactly you know, what it tastes like when it grows out of the red dirt down in uh, Brazil. I bet it's fantastic. May I ask, how did you happen onto this? Like, how did you run across the fact that there were a bunch of uh, folks from Alabama that went down to Brazil? I believe I read something about the Confederados and I was like, what is a Confederado? What are Confederados? Yeah. And that took me down the rabbit hole. And then I was just astounded that I had never heard of it. And them. do you think that they tell like a watered down version to the Brazilians when they explain their difficulties up in America? <laughs> like, oh, you know, we had some differences is over, um, <clears throat> you know, like political, uh, you know, structures and stuff. And then somebody from Brazil's up in America and comes back and is like, okay, you guys, they have not told us even half the story. You want to know what it really was? Well, they're very yeah. suspect of them at first because, first of all, they really stood out. Most of the Southerners who moved there were very fair, very like I mean, was going to say, they, they looked just kind of so pudgy different. and sweaty yeah. and burning Pale. easily in the sun. Like, what shade of pink yeah. are you? Like, this is weird. And you can yeah. picture their clothes. They got the big belly and yes. they got the, the trousers and the pleats and the and the cuffs down at the, the ankle. I you know, I, right. I can I can see it. It feels like a Cohen Brothers movie. This does feel like the Cohen Brothers could do a movie about yes. the Confederado. Well, incidentally, the land that Don Pedro offered to them when they first got there was basically swampland. So that's <laughs> yeah. when they were like, you know what, we're gonna have to put our gold to work. We can't use this land. And then they, they yeah. ventured to the interior. 
Yeah, sent them first to the super fun site. Right. <laughs> and then they were like, wait a minute. Now this isn't going to work. Uh, what's the uh, return policy here? So anyways, Colonel, that is going to do it for episode number two of Killer Biography. Fantastic episode. Great story. I really learned a, a little slice of history that I had not known. And I was nervous at the beginning, even with the corporate sign off. I was like, wait, two yes. biographies? But as you say, it's really it was really the uh, biography of a people, True. you know, of people in I highly exile. recommend that you look up a photo of William Hutchinson Norris and then obviously Horace. Definitely check out the picture of Carter visiting Americana. Incredible. Yeah. If you're a descendant like nowadays, um, living down in Americana and you want to come back to America for for schooling, I think the college application just writes yeah. itself. I mean, that's a it's hell incredible. of a story. And again, a lot of those descendants ended up coming back to America to get educated. And then they just went back to Brazil. Yeah. You can see why they would want a doctor. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, we got to get some doctors they need every family down here. Yeah. Like we know how to grow stuff and that's great. And we picked out the red soil, but now we need like some doctors, maybe a lawyer. We got to, I just think know. it's hilarious. And again, you mentioned the Cone brothers, like with everyone having these thick Southern accents in Brazil, like you step off the <laughs> plane, like you're like the, what? the native Brazilian. How do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We might have to work on your southern accent. That that felt um, more of a western. Was that Starsky and Hutch? Like who was there? I think that was, <laughs> they're not. Were they in the south? Who had the, the car with the Confederate flag? Is that that wasn't uh, Starsky? And Hutch. Dukes of Hazard. Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Uh, can't Y'all believe get that along, they're man. still. Yeah. Boss Hog. I uh, there's a person who lives in my neighborhood whose dad played Boss Hog. Are you serious? Yeah. And he, it turned out the guy that played Boss Hog was like a, I forget if he was like a Juilliard oh trained actor or Yale drama school trained. <laughs> like he was like, did Shakespeare and stuff, but <laughs> he comes paid himself. the bills by playing Boss Hog. It's interesting. We've had two episodes and they both sort of relate to the jungle and to South yeah, America. That is strange. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see where next week takes us. We're going to move outside the jungle next week. I can say that much. We're going to go somewhere else. Okay, so let's play our outro music for Killer Biographies, and we'll see everyone next week. For episode three. <laughs>